During Steve and Ann's visit to the U.S. sailboat show in Annapolis, Maryland a while back, there was a bit more than could be fit in an episode. So in this bonus video, they'll chat with old friends of Ann, Nika Waters, and her husband Jeremy. They've cruised extensively on their 28-foot Bristol Channel Cutter Calypso since they became the owners in 1992. Yeah, so one big critique that we get very regularly is that the cockpit is way too small. And I would say that our cockpit is actually it's, uh, about this width, um, but probably one and almost a half times as long. And the bridge deck is maybe a little bit bigger. And people's main concern is socializing and cocktail hour and all of that. So obviously this is not a terribly big cockpit. And you're saying that you had a family on board and mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys had friends over. Oh yeah. So, so what did you do? How did you manage cocktail hour? <laughs> cocktail hour? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Well, a cocktail hour happens. I mean, it is a small cockpit, but uh, you know, the, the, this boat was designed by Lyle Hess, and Lyle Hess was very opinionated, as are most naval architects, around size. You know, it, it's both balancing um, how the cockpit size affects the rest of the boat, uh, but also how the cockpit ultimately affects um, the safety of the boat at sea. And, and that the cockpit well is very small; it has big drains. It um, it's designed to hold as little water as possible, drain rapidly, and not risk uh, overflowing water down the companionway. Um, you know, this is a 28-foot boat, and I think this is a re reasonable size uh, cockpit for an ocean-going 28-foot boat. I think if you're doing uh, uh, something that you want to entertain people on, and that's a primary mission, that that's a very different uh, boat that you're going to be designing within a 28-foot form factor. I think Morris make great examples of that today. They make 28-foot day sailors, right? Yeah. Um, where, yeah the ha cockpit where, would be where half of the boat is a cockpit. The yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the Illyrian, the, the Harris off Illyrian is a 26-footer, and it's, yeah, you know, the similar. cockpit's probably like three times as long as this. Yeah. Um, and you can sleep on the boat. We've done it, but it's, um, that one's tiny. But, but socializing, I mean, I think that what you do is you, you invite people to come over and socialize. And you sit here, and, and you might be elbow to elbow, but um, certainly we're not going to host 20 people for cocktails, but we have had, we, we have routinely have two or three other people over for dinner. Um, we'll eat in the cockpit if the weather is good enough for it, and we can probably have up to two other couples, so, or, you know, four other people over, and we could have cocktails pretty comfortably, including, you know, having a cutting board with nibbles and places to put down your drink. Um, we could have six people probably total in, the, in this cockpit, and not feel like we were sitting on each other's laps. How do you feel about having the, the tiller versus a wheel? Do you wish that you, that you had a wheel up here? Are you happy with the tiller? How's that been? Uh, well, both of us have sailed a lot of boats, sailed a lot of different kinds of boats, and so certainly familiar with sailing a boat with a wheel and sailing a boat with a tiller. Um, I love the tiller and that it is very direct feedback on what's going on with the boat and the rig and, and how she's tracking through the water. Um, this boat being a transom hung rudder, uh, you know, it's a bit of the barn door hanging out there and uh, not a balanced rudder and uh, tends to have a little bit of weather helm by, by design because that's, uh, that's safer than the opposite. Um, I often steer this boat using my feet. Um, Sorry to interrupt you real quick. Can you explain what weather helm is? I think that's sure. a term that a lot of people aren't going to be familiar with. Sure. So uh, weather helm is the tendency of the boat to want to round up and face directly into the wind, as opposed to lee helm, which is the tendency of the boat to want to follow the wind and go nose down and go stern to the wind. And uh, uh, weather helm is regarded generally uh, within uh, you know. Uh, boat design as a desirable characteristic, a small amount of weather helm, uh, just because as the boat becomes overpowered, uh, say in a very strong gust situation, the boat will have a tendency to round into the wind and unload uh, the sail plan and allow the boat to, to right itself. Um, you know, and, and a boat with lee helm in a situation like that might actually exacerbate the, the, the emergency and uh, turn the boat to face uh, even more wind and heel the boat over even more. Um, and so a little bit of weather helm is usually desirable. And this being a big rudder, like I say, I often, I often sail it using, using my feet from the leeward side. Yeah, and you just <laughs> so, push on it. You're bench pressing, yeah. yeah. And then we can see that you've got uh, some cleats on either side here and a line. Uh, yeah. And it looks like right now you have it kind of clove hitched there to, to the tiller. So what's all that about? Yeah, so this is a nylon three strand and uh, there's, uh, on this boat, there's nothing preventing the rudder from uh, 
turning so far where the where the cheeks or other parts of the rudder might make contact with the transom, uh, just from wave action within the harbor uh, or, or wherever you are, and ultimately that can cause damage to to the rudder. Um, and so the the nylon uh, line here keeps the rudder centered, but allows a little bit of springy motion that uh, you know prevents any kind of shock loading of, of the pintles and gudgeons or, or anything else um, you know in, in the rudder structure. And when we're not using it to tie off the what it's what it's hooked on is actually we have a um, an Auto electronic pilot. autopilot, so yeah. a tiller pilot, and so that's one attachment point for that. I mean, what, do you know what you're going to do for, for self steering? Um, looking at self steering wind vanes, yeah. So yeah. we're trying to do some research on that, and you, you guys had mentioned that you were looking yeah. forward to one. So uh, what's we, the story with so that? We previously had a, a monitor wind vane on this boat. So, okay. uh, you know, monitor is made by Scanmar in California. They have a great reputation, make a very nice, shiny stainless steel uh, servo pendulum uh, 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 wind vane. Um, and uh, that worked, it worked beautifully. It was, it, it worked marvelously. Yeah, yeah. We're not getting rid of it because it didn't work. Okay. No, no, but it was a, it was, it was a, a unit that came with the boat. It was uh, original to the boat from 1976 and, uh, you know, Stainless steel is not impervious material, and uh, you know it was exhibiting some crevice corrosion and weld failures that you know we had been getting fixed over time, and um, uh, you know ultimately it just became a got to replace it or do something different because it's not going to just can't keep it going forever. So uh, we're in the process of building a uh, trim tab uh, uh, wind vane system. Um, it's patterned very much after designs that uh, Larry Pardee and uh, Mike Anderson developed in the in the 70s, um, and so a trim tab literally is like um, uh, a small sliver attached to the trailing edge of, of the rudder. Uh, you often see them on, on aircraft wings, where like as you turn this this little this little vein that's in the water attached to the, the trailing edge of the rudder, you can actually cause cause the rudder to move in the opposite direction that you turn the, the, the trim tab. You know, we have the, the main tiller here, uh, and we have this teeny tiny uh, trim tab tiller over here uh, that if I drop the locking mechanism off, this, this tiller actually moves independently and um, uh, act, you know, articulates, turns the, the trim tab, uh, which is uh, down in the water hanging off the shaft uh, along the trailing edge of the, of the rudder. And so we hook the, the tiller pilot up to, to this pin. And, uh, you know, you can conceptually see that I can push or pull this pin to move the trim tab uh, one way or the, or the other and, and could steer the boat that way. The trim tab uh, never feels the effects of, say, Weatherhelm or Leehelm, and is almost always very neutral feeling no matter how, how, how much wind is blowing or how fast the boat is moving. And so hooking the electronic autopilot up to the trim tab tiller, uh, it's, it's, it's effortless for, for, the, for the electronic autopilot to actuate the trim tab tiller. And so correspondingly, I, I expect that uh, we only had this thing for one season so far. I expect that the electronic autopilots will uh, have a much longer service life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're working way less hard. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, the, we had found when we're looking is that this boat weighs 14,000 pounds, and a lot of the tiller pilot, the, the tiller autopilot electronic people, they don't expect anybody to have a tiller on a boat that weighs that much. And so they're all very underpowered. Oh, okay. And so even, I think even the most, the most robust and most expensive one was designed for boats that are, you know, max like 8,000 pounds. And they're just the, assuming that the, if you have a boat that big, you right, have a wheel. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so it's, um, we actually did just get a new electronic autopilot we bought from Scanmar. We bought a Plagic autopilot that is a tiller pilot, but it's designed. That's the other problem with some of the um, some of the commercially available ones is that they're not waterproof. They don't even claim to be water resistant. Oh, and wow. so, on the on the trip up north, <laughs> little, we we had to actually put the autopilot down below. Yeah. And that. That's that's actually really when you want it is when it's when the weather's turned to crap. You really don't want to be out here hand steering, yeah. and but you couldn't have it out there. So we're excited about the Plagic and the the waterproof robustness of that unit and how it's we're pretty pleased with how it's put together. So Jeremy's got to install that. Okay, so. nice. And then finally, um, I wanted to know a little bit about. Um, making the switch over, my GPS is old on my boat, and I'm thinking about making the switch over to 
using an iPad or my phone. I've been using my phone pretty exclusively just for now. But when I go further, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to afford an AIS transceiver or anything like that. But it'd be nice to be able to see stuff. Yeah. Um, and you're using iPad, yeah? Or, yeah. or a tablet. A tablet. Yep. We're using yep. an iPad, but uh, you know you can use Android tablets as well. Um, you know this being, uh, you know I think it's characteristic of like small boot problems again, where there's limited real estate in the right. cockpit um, to, uh, to to mount uh, uh, you know a modern chart plotter or anything like that. Those things are often mounted on, on wheel binnacles, and uh, you know a small tiller boat doesn't have a wheel binnacle, and uh, yeah. uh, you know it lacks some of the other. Uh, you know, uh, other places you might otherwise mount uh, a large uh, chart plotter. So yeah, we've we've adopted using um, uh, an iPad here. Nothing special about it. This is not a waterproof case. It's just a shockproof case. Um, and uh, you know, we've been using principally the Navionics app um, that uh, you know Garmin acquired Navionics like two years ago. I don't know. Um, and you know the things I like about it are, um, well, you can take this thing anywhere. Like you want to sit down over dinner and just look over, like where are we going next week, and uh, look at, at what's ahead. You can do some uh, some basic, uh, uh, you know, cruise planning, uh, figuring out where you want to go, drop some pins right on the electronic chart to, to mark some some interesting highlights, uh, and then later bring it back. Um, and this thing is hooked up, um, getting information uh, on this boat from, um, we have a Vesper a AIS, uh, and the AIS provides uh, GPS data, so the lat long, the course over ground, the speed over ground, uh, as well as information about AIS targets, so other boats in the area that are uh, transmitting their uh, AIS details, including lat long, course over ground, speed over ground, name of the vessel, where are they going, <laughs> yeah. um, lots of information like that. And uh, correspondingly, um, you know, it'll, it'll display the AIS targets in the chart, um, so you can see other boats, you can um, get the details of the boat, you can get the name of the boat, if it looks like you need to communicate with them to figure out a crossing situation you can call them by name yeah yeah I can, being I can, able to pinch that in and out is, is I, can huge zoom out. I know I the know new you ones see, do but like you know the I've got all these like uh, you know push pins all over the chart which are like points of interest some of them talk, talking from you about you know like oh you should check out this place or the other it's like well, I just dropped the push pin there oh, like, there's some you know, it becomes there's a some point of interest of like there's some yeah. yeah. push pins in there <laughs> <laughs> you know, or sometimes it's you know where did we anchor, uh, you know, uh, either just so that we can reference uh, what our drift might be around where we anchored, you know, whether we've, you know, dragged, uh, or it was a great anchorage and want to be able to come back and, like, anchor in the same place and uh, just accumulating, like, our personal library of uh, cool points of interest like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people poo-poo uh, the idea of not using true marine equipment for, um, you know, navigation like this. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it is true, this is not a waterproof piece of equipment. Like, uh, you know, when it gets really, uh, really nasty out and we're, we're taking, uh, you know, spray or, or it's a heavy squall and we're getting this, like, solid, solid rain, rain water through here, this device goes below. And um, that, you know, that frankly works. You can put it on the chart table down there. You can actually see it from the cockpit. Um, you know, one person could be down below checking the, the chart every now and then, and uh, you know providing feedback to whoever's up in the cockpit. Um, yeah. But we had a drop. We've got a, a smoke glass, plexiglass drop yeah, board that goes have, in, and then you know so that keeps a bunch yeah. of the spray out, and, and I can angle it so Jeremy can just see. Yeah, it, we do so. have a set of yeah. both wood and um, Lexan yeah, hatch ports. Awesome. So, um, uh, oh, that's smart. you know, actually love the Lexan hatch boards when we're living on the boat because uh, you know, when we're light. down below and it's cold and we put the hatch boards in you can see what's going on outside um, or you know if we've dropped the hatch boards in because we're sailing and it's gotten snotty you can see what's going on inside as well as getting a you know a basic glance at, at the chart at what, what's going on on the chart yeah um, so. yeah you hear a crash down below and right. you can just see look what down fell. yeah <laughs> <laughs> playing that game of is it stove? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for showing us around your cockpit, you guys. Yeah, yeah I really comments. appreciate it. You're it's welcome. Great information. Thanks for coming.